<laughs> Thank you for the presumptuous applause. Uh, it's Friday. People probably want to go home or go to a bar. So I'm going to talk really quickly. No, I'm going to, we should be done in, in good time, providing no one asks any long drawn out questions about where the bar is. Um, so this talk has kind of got two titles of, do you want ants, because that's how you get ants, of, it's explaining how actual breaches, uh, some of the reasons they happen and how they can not happen, rather than me going through like breach reports or whatever. Um, who am I? I? I work at Etsy, I just have to check. I used to work in Puppet Labs, which um, is why they occasionally invite me to speak about security. I used Puppet back when it was really, really old. Um, and um, I've only been in big trouble with a phone company once. And I have a lot of Puppet t-shirts, like five years of Puppet t-shirts. Don't do that. Or Puppet Labs t-shirts. I don't have any Puppet t-shirts. Controversial. Um, what is this talk about? It's about risk and threat modeling. Um, I use that term a bunch. Uh, reality, because a lot of InfoSec is not based in reality. It's based in either RSA, PR, media, or um, people trying to follow the plot of the net or any other terrible film, which seems to be where most threat modeling is actually based. Um, what to focus on and how to be more secure but slightly less hipster, um, which is ridiculous when you look at me. Um, but it's mostly going like the security equivalent of a fixie bicycle is cool and all, but it probably won't get you up a hill to mix so many analogies at once. Um, and why security is an idiot for just focusing on one thing and not really, um, and like that thing has to be perfect rather than if you go from zero to 80% secure, that's better than going from 80 to 85% secure. And, and like most security people go, no, you need the more secure one. You're like, well, actually, you know, you need to get us secure before you can start trying to improve it. Um, and security is like, if we can't get to the moon, why even put anything up at all? And you're like, well, Whatever. So it's mostly me, me being angry at security. Shocker. This talk is not about mad zero day. It's, there's no like ridiculous, amazing exploits. I don't really care for those. Um, hopefully not a vendor pitch, though it is Black Friday soon, and Cyber Monday. So if you want to buy things on Etsy.com, providing DNS works, I would love that. Um, I'm not. <laughs> More on that later. Who knew DNS was important? Um, I'm not going to read out breach reports, as you can all do that, and you can probably read better than I can, or Nessus, because who cares? Um, there might be mild audience participation. If any of you are British or have Canadian ancestry, you can step out of that, because I realize that would be too awkward. Um, it's mostly around yes, no questions, nothing too. I get, I only use two microphones. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing too intense. I just wanted to forewarn you. I realize it's late on a Friday. Um, also, a disclaimer, because what security talk isn't good without a disclaimer. If you are Google, Facebook, blah, 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 BA systems, if you make missiles, uh, if you're a part of Five Eyes or whatever, OPM probably doesn't count because they haven't yet got any security. Um, then this obviously doesn't apply to you. Don't listen to me. You employ far more clever people than me. But someone will go, at this place, in our rocket silo, we use this. And I'm like, sure, I work for a knitting website, so. <laughs> um, we don't have that. <sighs> and because it's a security talk, I have a beer, as is tradition dictates. So th let's start with an easy question about what is threat modeling. Um, because I'm English and I'm on an H1B, which is the fashion model visa, um, which actually is, I found this out recently, it was like, I'm never saying I work in tech again. I'm just a fashion model. And as a former model, I think I'm qualified to talk about threat modeling. Um, <laughs> which I, for a while on LinkedIn, my job title was Hort Couture Threat Model, um, which not enough people enjoyed, I think. I think that was a very funny joke and was undervalued. But it's mostly uh, to be reductive, which I'm gonna do a bunch in this talk because it's a talk. Uh, it's working out who might attack you and how. Uh, that's the, like, there are books this thick on threat modeling. I just said it in a sentence. I've saved you some money. You can thank me later. Um, it's evaluating risks and reality, and reality is a word that terrifies security people. Um, 
because, I don't know, they're all armchair academics? I don't know. And impact is another thing. Um, uh, varying degrees of breach have varying degrees of, of trouble, like an XSS in your uh, PHP website displaying your photos, not quite as bad as, I don't know, DNS being down? Ooh. Or like uh, credit cards exposed on the internet, blah, blah, blah. So first, uh, a premise. Are humans good at evaluating risk? No. <laughs> cool, I skipped to the end. Um, <laughs> so there's the argument that they are because we stayed alive when they were like mammoths and other cool animals, um, and they had bigger teeth than we do. So we were quite good at going, let's not stick our head in that. Um, so we evaluated that risk. Now there are fewer of them, despite preservationists' hard, hard work. Um, I think we've kind of l lost some of the uh, brilliant threat modeling that once kept us alive in our Neanderthal ways. So to prove this, have any of you, this is the audience participation bit, so just so you're aware, have any of you ever said, have a safe flight? Or has anyone ever said to you, have a safe flight? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? Has anyone ever said to you, have a safe drive to the airport? <laughs> because you may as well follow it with, no, no, I haven't cut your brake lines. <laughs> There's absolutely no reason you should worry about the drive to the airport. Um, so much so that I, I did a talk very similar to this at the weekend in Canada, and this is the email my boss sent to me. Safe flight. He obviously hasn't seen my slides, which talk about having safe flights. So whatever, flying. There's a spare pilot. Um, it's com mostly computer controlled, despite what those smooth talking BA pilots will tell you. They have spare engines. All planes can lose, all, all commercial planes can lose at least a whole engine, which is terrifying and also wonderful. Depending on if you've gone, oh, I think we need that. Or <laughs> if you've landed and gone, oh yeah, we didn't need that. Um, there's like hundreds of hours of qualifications, regular safety checks. The FAA won't even let you take Samsung phones on them, <laughs> which is probably just protecting consumers, because really, Android, what are you thinking? Um, so taxis. They have this little pine thing that smells quite nice, some of them. And that ends the safety features on most taxis. <laughs> Like, it's this person you've never met who probably has no more qualification than you to drive, who has been driving all day, and is a taxi driver who are all well known for trying to kill everyone else on Earth. <laughs> yeah, so you haven't heard about the Uber story involving the hammer and the person. That's pretty dark. <laughs> Other ride-sharing schemes are available. Um, so every statistic says, Flying is a hundred times safer or even bigger numbers. Um, and there's like, even if you measure it in per flight or per billion miles traveled, uh, there is no way you can lie your way through statistics to go, random taxi drivers are safer than airplanes. So humans kind of suck at risk perception in that way. At least that's how I see it. Um, that was all rather bleak. So here's a picture of a cute kitten falling over. Um, just because I don't want everyone to come away with a negative message about plane crashes. <laughs> Though there's only ever been one water landing where not everyone died. Back to the kitten. Um, <laughs> but there's only ever been three water landings because I look these things up on flights because I'm really cheery. <laughs> this is going well, isn't it? How long have I got left? Eek. So security, what is it? Um, if one looks at the Oxford English Dictionary as one should, because that is what the Queen would use, um, <laughs> it's the state or condition of being or feeling secure. Who knows the difference between being secure and feeling secure? That gentleman there with the suddenly larger beard than when I last saw him. Uh, being secure is never, feeling secure is sometimes. I'm English, I never feel secure. I'm in a constant state of being insecure, so <laughs> not. But the, the difference between being secure and feeling secure is you think you're one until you find out you're the other. Because um, you're like, no, no, we're definitely secure. Uh, yeah, Din, whatever. Um, 
So yeah, being or feeling secure. Um, but that isn't the whole picture in security because it's not like an absolute, despite what everyone selling you things will tell you. Secure from whom? Um, you've got multiple attackers on multiple levels. Uh, and there's like people with terrible scripts, script kiddies, which are the above, but have watched a YouTube tutorial. Um, if you have a bug bounty on your website, 80% of attacks are from them, um, probably. And 1% of those are useful, but more on that in another talk. Um, red teams or pen tests or whatever they're called this week, um, you have those, but you have them like every six months or three months. I'm reasonably confident attackers don't go, oh, we won't attack now. We did it recently. We should wait another five months. Um, <laughs> could be wrong. My perception is they don't really care about your time scales. Um, other attackers, China. China is obviously recently has been pretty good, though Russia is the new flavor of the month, especially if you run an email server. <laughs> Hackers in it for the lols. We all know what they are. Hacktivists, which I still don't believe exist. Um, it's just a cool term used by Vice magazine. And hacking for profit, which is actually a real thing depending on your industry. Um, <laughs> but here, here, here are the main ones that everyone defends against. The NSA, <laughs> now and then the FBI, which is like, oh, Button, you tried. Um, <laughs> uh, everyone who forgets about like CSE and other, um, other parts of Five Eyes who are all pretty good at owning things, and then GCHQ who have absolutely no morals and will stream your um, Yahoo chat videos and just go, cool, yeah, we don't care. So go Britain, imperialism. Um, from everything I've read in the like last year or two, everything has to be NSA proof. And here are some links proving that. Um, and these are all like just like random things that like people can do at home in between watching like V for Vendetta and like Reddit. Um, <laughs> ooh, sick burn. Um, v for Vendetta, a wonderful comic book. Um, but those aren't really affecting most businesses. I mean, the iCloud one doesn't count because you do that to steal pictures. But it turns out that like even people who have occasional real jobs uh, are terrified of the NSA. And like an NSA-proof operating system, yes, for real, except it's Cubes, which runs on Zen, which has floppy disk drivers that have exploits in. So not really. Uh, NSA-proof passwords, like they care about passwords. And they proof SSH, like they care about SSH. Um, physicists are building an NSA proof internet because physicists are the people I want doing my threat model. <laughs> physicists with their, with their decades of fighting the NSA at every turn. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, bless. I mean, they're trying. It's, that's more than the chemists are doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, unless you're one of the people I pointed out in the disclaimer, the NSA should probably not be in your threat model. Um, this probably upsets a lot of people. Uh, if you're Google, yeah, the NSA is probably featuring your threat model because they have graphs with SSL removed here, which is pretty mature of them. Uh, if you're the 3PLA, the NSA is in your threat model. Uh, if anyone here is from the 3PLA, love your work. Enjoy reading all my email. Um, cool. Um, if you're not any of those people, like we're a knitting website. I don't know if I mentioned that. The NSA is not in our threat model because it's the NSA. We're a knitting website. We're not going to defend against the NSA. We have more important things to defend against. And that's the difference. And like this is, I'm sure this is controversial to many, but like, Shouldn't we defend against everyone? No, you should defend against people you can defend against and not waste money defending against um, people you have no hope of defending against. So who here has a security budget of around 50 billion a year? Five billion a year. It's like being an auctioneer. Uh, five million. Okay, so there's, there's a, a few people who have a five million um, budget, so you're only 10,000 times smaller budget than the NSA. So just spend your money on other things. Um, so ha attackers have budgets. NSA probably have the largest budget. Um, 
because freedom. Um, <laughs> but assuming attackers, uh, attackers have budgets and they have time constraints and they have hiring problems, um, just the same way defenders do, and generally the person with the most money wins, that's what this country was founded on. Um, I'm just getting more controversial as I go. <laughs> That's fine. I'm treating it like a security con rather than a place I used to work. Um, it's fine, it's fine. The new CEO doesn't even know me, it's fine. Um, so the point is, once you can defend against everyone up to the NSA, then worry about the NSA. Um, worrying about them before that point, you're just gonna let like script kiddies and hacktivists in um, while going, oh, we must encrypt all our fiber and coat it in sealed tubes and monitor the air pressure in the tube in case anyone drills into it to try and vampire tap our fiber while we uh, do layer two encryption over that and then IPSEC over that. It's like, you, you could spend that money, yeah, or you could buy a security team and like see if you have S XSS in your website. I, I reckon that the other one is maybe the way to go. I don't run your company uh, for the best, really. but. I would say hiring a security team better than like buying layer two crypto for most people. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, but the NSA, uh, the NSA, bless. InfoSec needs to stop with the NSA fetishism and the security nihilism of like, well, the NSA can own us. Yeah, and like also the military can probably own you. Um, but you don't worry about that. Well, you might worry about that. I don't know. I, I haven't watched Preppers in ages. Um, but like, Having a realistic threat model of like, I should probably put locks in my house. The army won't care about locks. They generally don't. Um, and like no one uses lock picks, even though everyone knows how to pick locks. Um, so like have a realistic, based in reality, based on people who have attacked you and will attack you, rather than going, we must defend against the biggest thing in the room. Because yeah, it's not realistic. Or go and work for Google where you have to worry about that. Which is again saying, learn to threat model in reality. If you're, if you're riseup.org, the place that has lots of uh, activists, then yeah, the government agencies are on your threat model because you're trying to overthrow them. If you're hosting or knitting website, you're in direct competition with us, so we're gonna come at you. But government agencies aren't in your threat model, just people with funny hair. Um, so impact, what impact is the thing I haven't talked upon yet. Um, what would you have to do to push a patch to something? Would you have to take things offline? Would you have to take, turn off all credit card uh, processing? Would you have to give everyone credit card monitoring and identity monitoring because that fixes a breach? Um, or would you have to call the FBI and go, no, no, it's a computer. A compu it's like a typewriter. <laughs> but with Wyatt, no, never mind, I'll call someone else. Um, I'm so be being beaten up if I go to DC. Um, so here's a very real world Topical, <laughs> topical moment. Defacement versus DDoS. If you're a, uh, a large DNS provider, your website looking, being defaced is annoying, but it won't cost you money. If you're currently being DDoSed in a number of gigabits or terabits, and you promise like 100% uptime, that's quite an expensive day for you. I would imagine, hypothetically. If you're a political party website, then your website being DDoSed is fine because no one goes there. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a defacement would be really bad if it was done with humor or truth. Two things, <laughs> two things seem to be lacking from this election cycle. Um, <laughs> why am I being so controversial? It's, it's like I don't want to come back next year. Um, this is more, more political things. What am I going, why am I doing this to myself? Um, if you're a hacker in the 90s, getting your mail spool dropped in a, in a zine or just put on the public internet was a real thing that happened to you and was hilarious for everyone but you. Um, and now if you're a presidential candidate, that can also happen to you. So well done the 90s for getting in there first. Um, but like, those are very real threats from two very different people. Like, uh, a, grimy hacker on IRC in the 90s and someone vying for the most powerful political position on earth. Both, both have the same, not quite, they have the same threat path, but not the same threat model. Um, in just your company, 
Uh, credit card processing done by you or someone else. Uh, shout out to Stripe because then you don't have to do PCI. Um, PII is quite a common target in that you can sell it. Um, a laptop's being stolen, which is a very low physical attack, but is still possibly an attack on your security because if laptops aren't encrypted, there is valuable data in there, there is passwords, you can impersonate people, or you can just sell them for much under the market value. Oh my God, there's someone appearing. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Lizard Squad, if they're not all in jail doing DDoS against large DNS providers, I can't prove that, but it sounds good. Um, Yeah, if you've ever used Google Image Search, it's not perfect. <laughs> so you don't want either of these, probably one more than the other. Um, but when I was going through San Francisco Airport the other day, I saw this, which, because this is a much more friendly conference, I blurred out the name of Barracuda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but like, all right, who wants to hear my favorite Barracuda joke? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Barracuda are the Toblerone of security because you'd actually prefer something else and you only find them in airports. <laughs> <laughs> it's just heartbreaking, heartbreaking. Moving on while I still have a job. Um, how do systems get owned or compromised or breached depending on your job title and where in the media chain you are? Um, the back in the 90s, when, when everyone was cool uh, and my hair fitted in, this is how you compromise machines using the awesome uh, RPC Mount D exploit, probably against Linux boxes. Um, shout out to our 90s sponsor there, Technique. Um, look them up for all your late 90s, O'Day. Uh, I'm trying to get back to public comp next year, so this is it, using my new type and provider that I'm gonna <laughs> release to the forge. Um, <laughs> sadly, the first time I've written public code in four years, but I didn't even know you could do here, dogs. It was mind blowing. Um, but time warp to now, 99% of servers probably don't have real world IPs. You have like ELB in front of it or a load balancer or something from Barracuda. I just can't help myself. Um, the cloud, NAT exists, load balancers, all that jazz, uh, IPv6. <laughs> no one uses that. Um, some people bought firewalls since the 90s, uh, back when everything was just plainly on the internet, or as it's now known now, AWS before VPCs, when everything was just on the internet. Um, there's been a lot of hardening in C and the OS of, to make actual those exploits harder, uh, which all have interesting names like DEP. I, is it SEP? Yeah, SEP, ASLR, and all that jazz. And hopefully you've patched that vulnerability and aren't running um, NFS on the public internet with a Red Hat machine from 20 years ago. If you haven't patched that, you should probably go and do that now. Because, um, yeah, not patching in 20 years is similar to Red Hat patch cycle but it's not, it's slightly better, slightly better. <laughs> That's CVE, still pending, you just need to recompile your kernels right out. So let's go to the other end of the spectrum, iOS, the, probably the most secure consumer OS available today. Um, sorry, Android. Um, so things we know about uh, iOS, like the FBI bought an, an exploit for $1 million to try and get some data off the phone. Zerodium, uh, who's a French company who deals in exploits for totally defense reasons. There's absolutely no way you can tie them with selling exploits to anything bad. Had a one million bounty for a full remote compromise uh, of, a, of an iOS device. Apple's own bug bounty, which they released two months ago, three months ago, um, is like hundreds of, thousand in hundred thousands of dollars for secure enclave breaks. Um, so given all this, all this information, if someone in your company has an iPhone, and I believe many people do now, um, it, it's rare you see Blackberries outside of Canada, that <laughs> they still have them, it's adorable. Um, <laughs> then like, surely, surely for like a mere, just over a million dollars, someone could get a foothold in your network via an IS exploit. Um, 
yeah, that's totally true. So you just need to have a spare million dollars as an attacker. Um, but that million dollars is just to spend on the exploit, not even the people to use it, and then the exfil and what have you. And also, owning you that much is worth well over one million, because people who do like commercial attacks do it for profit, so they have some business acumen. So they won't be like, yes, we owned you for $200 with that $1 million exploit, because that kind of goes out of business quite quickly. Um, I'm no MBA, but I, I think you need to make money on your exploits. Uh, and that also assumes there's no cheaper way of doing it. So people going, I need to secure um, my iPhone, because there could be exploits to it. It's like, yeah, you probably need to get rid of SQL injection in all your web pages first. And then later, we'll worry about IOS compromises, if that's fine with you. Um, and like securing IOS against mad government zero day, cool. Securing websites against SQLI via a framework, quite boring. No one wants to do it. One of them will make you much more secure. The other one um, won't, because Apple is better at securing phones than you. Um, sorry if there's any like jailbreak crews in the team. I apologize. Um, but th at the end of the day, your, your threat model has to be based on your company still making money. And if you're like, we can't have iPhones in the company because someone might spend a million dollars on an exploit. Um, everyone in your company is going to go, you're an idiot and you don't work here anymore. Um, this is the fun way of saying, zero day is also not your big, biggest worry. Um, how, so how can we fix this? With threat modeling. Um, if you have n months allocated to a security project, which of these, more audience participation, just cheer as loud as you can be bothered, um, which of these will get you a better return on your overall security? Rolling out GRSEC, so GRSEC is a bunch of patches to Linux that harden the kernel uh, in loads of ways and mitigate lots of zero day. Every time there's a CVE for something in Linux, uh, Spender goes on Twitter and goes, yeah, this was already, GRSEC would have stopped this. because." Um, I care about security, and Linus doesn't. Um, or rolling out a password manager to everyone in your organization. Which of those two? So one of these is awesomely cool tech, which stops O'Day, which is all anyone cares about if you read news and boring things like that. Um, the other involves talking to people in your company and helping them with the password manager. And I don't know anyone in security who got into security to talk to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he says, standing in front of a room talking to people. Um, but like, that's probably not why I got in the industry. That isn't why I spent hours sitting in my bedroom with ridiculous OpenBSD machines chatting on IRC so I could talk to other people about installing password managers. That's just not what security people do. So they focus on the, the cool thing that will never probably happen versus the horror show of passwords. Um, so based on those two things, which would you choose? So this graph shows that really you should choose password managers because that will actually hugely increase the security of your company versus GRSEC. And GRSEC is cool, but GRSEC shouldn't be the first thing you do because having passwords that aren't written down on everything is kind of good. Um, having passwords that aren't awful, kind of good. And this is from the Verizon data breach report that comes out every year and gets worse every year, um, which is a shame. Um, this is actually verbatim. Uh, the boy howdy it works is not from me, which shows I'm not alone talking like an idiot in presentations. <laughs> but it, it's, it's an interesting report. Um, and it shows that, like, yeah, passwords are still terrible. Who knew? So on the topic of passwords, this is, <laughs> I dare say the clue is in the name. This is a joke that doesn't work in England as we spell things properly. <laughs> um, I suffer for my art. So to use the, come on, click. Oh, no, it did. Um, so it's time for a terrible analogy. Come with me. Um, so passwords are basically keys, it, like keys in the physical sense. Um, if, so if, if at home or your business you care more about security, do you buy cheap, crappy keys and then replace your locks in your whole house or whole organization every month? Anyone do that? Or do you buy decent, probably German, locks, and then not worry about it because you've bought good locks? Some people do that. Um, no, one, no one goes like, oh, it's first Tuesday of the month, 
But to get the chisel out, take all the locks out, throw them away and put new locks in, and then give everyone new keys, like, that would be ridiculous. Um, I mean, no one does the other thing, and, like, no one picks locks that actually break into anything either, but stop questioning my analogy. Just come with me. So who's ever seen anything like this? Yeah, that is your cheap, crappy locks being replaced every month. Uh, and you having to go around and change them in every part of your house or business. Oh, I'm getting to that. It's like, this, this slide shows it. Which of these is better? Um, I'm so glad there aren't acts. summer 2015? Uh, which of these is better next month? <laughs> Summer 2016 was a long, um, I don't know, a while ago? A month ago? Yeah, a few months ago. Yeah. It depends on your password rotation policy. If it's seasonal, then you'd put like autumnal in the password, which would be beautiful. But, or fall, uh, it's shorter, less secure. <laughs> British English wins again. Um, you're wrong, Ben, because reasons. So the first one, um, Guessing the first one, you can probably guess the string of the, the, the following ones. And like, if there's a number at the end, has anyone ever increased the number at the end of a password to get round password expiry? Yep. Yep. So, and how many people have decreased the number? No, everyone just increases them. So, because, <laughs> so you can kind of guess the order it's going to go. Or if it's got the name of the month in, and you, ha you or a friend has access to a calendar, you can probably, <laughs> you can probably find some way of breaking the cryptographic code of months and finding what the current one is, or narrowing it down to one of three to try. Um, but like, also, if you're changing it all the time, you'll either write it down. Uh, it will have much less entropy because you can't, because you have to remember it because the policy says I have to. Uh, change it all the time. And then if Hashcat, which is a great tool for cracking passwords, it will probably never get the really long one until the heat death of the universe, which is something my threat model features heavily, because that's one of our main concerns. Um, <laughs> whereas the first one that was like some numbers, the word password and month, yeah, it would get that before the GPU got warm. Um, because it's just not very cryptographically secure. If you want more than passwords, uh, I would say throw money at Duo Security, who do awesome 2FA things, and buy YubiKeys, which are cool cryptographic um, tokens that pl either plug into the side of your laptop or live on your keychain, and they can store RSA keys, they can do one-time tokens, you can do UTF and um, talk to I know, a bunch of services. Um, no one uses RSA Secure ID anymore, which is good. I'm sure some people do, but that's only to log into their NT4 servers. Um, <laughs> I can talk about these for forever, so just hit me up if you want to talk about those forever. Um, oh, I already read that bit. I don't remember writing these. Cool, that. Cool, that. Um, U2F is only really used on like Dropbox, GitHub, and Google, but like a couple of people use Google. I hear they bring out an email product or something. And They've just rebranded to G Suite for their office, for their, like notes and, no, not notes, docs and spreadsheets and all that jazz. So they're like trying to be hip and young again. Bless. Um, but most importantly, as, as Bill in fact touched on, stop making your colleagues hate you because having to change your password every month is a good way of making everyone in your organization hate your security team if they don't already, for various reasons. Um, I've never heard of a breach uh, where it's gone, the, the breach report has gone, if only they changed their shitty password to another shitty password. Um, <laughs> then that would have been fine, because there's no way they can guess two shitty passwords. Um, but I have heard of breaches due to people not listening to or wanting to interact with their security team, which is actually far more value for money uh, in terms of your business, hopefully, um, than having, having shitty passwords. Kind of seems obvious. Uh, all that stuff DevOps did or didn't do, depending on who's at the sponsor theater. Um, 
The same thing kind of applies to security, because talking to them, well, they regale you with tales of hacking in the 90s and how everything was cooler, but also they go like, yeah, we're vaguely human as well. Let's meet in the middle about this. Um, madness, I know, security teams being nice. It will never work, I agree, but let's, let's believe for the sake of this. Um, we try and make our security team friendly and approachable. We mostly do this by buying a lot of candy from nuts.com and having that at where we all sit. And because everyone's addicted to sugar, um, people just come by and go like, hey, security, just can talk to you for a bit because we have to when we're stealing this candy. Um, so it means people know who we are. And it's, it's of our budget probably the thing that gets the most um, people talking to us and is actually a good investment, not to uh, like give a vendor pitch for nuts.com. Um, why do this? Other than working for a hugging company, I obviously work for Etsy where it's all about hugging and other things and knitting probably. Um, the main reason, or not the main reason, but a really strong reason for doing this um, is what happens if you <laughs> Google image search for phishing. You get someone holding a very bad fishing rod over a laptop. And that's not the worst image for phishing. That's just how bad marketing is. So phishing, uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of this fantastic underground technique um, <laughs> where someone sends you an email and then you click on it and it goes to a website um, outside of InfoSec that's actually called marketing. Um, <laughs> but, but InfoSec decided they wanted a new term, so phishing it is. Um, yeah, one of them you give up all your personal information and your email is ruined. The other one's phishing. Um, <laughs> mm, mm. God, I'm so unemployed next week. Um, so, solving phishing. Hands up, who's solved phishing? Not a lot of hands. Um, so, oh, yeah, I sh probably shouldn't have left their name in if I wasn't going to name them. Um, <laughs> watch. I'm just going to get, yeah, let's move on from that. So if 99% of people uh, in your company click on a phishing email versus 9% of people click on a phishing email, um, you're still compromised. Like, they've, they've still got in because they only need one to click on them uh, to, like, run the reverse shell bank in your network persistence. So unless you can reduce phishing to zero, like, it's... Obviously, try and reduce it, but don't go like, oh, it's, it's like 5% now, we're done. Um, the actual useful thing to do is solving phishing incident response. Having people come and tell you when a weird email comes in or a weird message comes in uh, and actually go and tell your security team, even if they've clicked on it and typed in every single password they know, uh, is way better than them not telling you because then you can go, oh, yeah, we can do something about this now between drinking and sobbing. Um, Whereas if they're like, uh, yeah, type all my stuff in, throw laptop out window, I didn't do anything, then that doesn't help you do incident response because you don't know about it. Um, and having a, a holier-than-thou security team is not the way to do it. Um, that will be the last time they bother coming to you with something weird. And we've uh, had so many things where someone's gone, this looks weird. And they're like, yep, that's weird. Uh, we're going to take the rest of the day on this. Versus, and like when people send in things like, this looks like a phishing email, and like, no, that's a thing you signed up for. But rather than saying, no, that's a thing you signed up for, I go, no, that's, that's not, it's cool. Um, but thank you for sending it our way. Like that brief change from a security team will stop more breaches than buying Barracuda. Or whoever, whoever. <laughs> um, like if you, if you block, if security is constantly blocking, then um, people will find a way to do things. Like uh, we can't get this, they won't like open a port on a firewall, put something in a DMZ or Z. Um, so you go like, okay, that's fine. We'll just randomly host it on AWS and tunnel it back. And then you're like, yeah, please never do that. Um, but if you keep saying no to everything, then the, the people would, to do their jobs will work around you. And that is kind of not what you want. Um, like I worked at a place that blocked all outbound traffic other than I think port 443. So I'm like, cool, I'll just tunnel over the proxy with corkscrew and now my internet's back, so I just have to run an additional program. Okay, that you haven't made anything more secure, uh, but you did annoy me for five minutes. I was gonna say is a, a great example of that is for an organization that would, you go around the office and there's a Chromium firewall policy and everybody had on their desk a completely secure Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's, that's awesome. That's, uh, <laughs> oh, that's so good. No, no, I'm not, I'm not touching the firewall. It's fine. It's fine. Um, so security people need to be kind of nicer in general, and that would go a long way to bridging some gaps to have a kind of Etsy knitting, hugging part of the talk. Um, and that will like actually pay dividends and has paid dividends for us. And certainly we've been other places that have, let's say, the other perspective on security. And we've all gone, we never want to work there or with those people. They seem really mean. Um, but it just, yeah, having, being able to have a security team that people can talk to is uh, something we strive very hard for. And I suggest you all do too. Um, cool. So now we've got three minutes left. So the second half is going to be quite quick. Um, it's not really. So yeah, all the points I've covered. Conclusions are kind of pointless because you've already just seen it like 20 minutes ago. Um, yeah, pick the boring def definite wins like password managers over things, awesome things like GR security. You will not get a black hat or DEF CON talk out of rolling out a password manager, which I think is actually a crying shame because that would actually be useful to people. Um, whereas like GRSec will probably get uh, a black hat talk, but one of them will actually make you more secure. Um, cool. Let's go find a bar or an airline. Either of those. I'm done. We're done. You can all go home or go to the hotel.